So good evening, everyone. My name is Peter Tabbins. I'm the MPP for Toronto Danforth. Uh, thanks for joining us this evening for this session on long-term care navigation. Uh, we've got a lot of interest. We've got a very strong panel, uh, and we've got an hour ahead of us, a lot of information to get out, and hopefully a lot of questions to be answered. I'm going to start off by reading our land acknowledgement. We acknowledge we're hosted on the lands of the Mississaugas of the Anishinaabe, the Haudenosaunee Confederacy, and the Wendat. We also recognize the enduring presence of all First Nations, Métis, and Inuit peoples. And I want to add that although land acknowledgement is a good thing, we also need to go further than that and actually engage in concrete reconciliation with First Nations in this country. So the purpose of this meeting this evening, we're going to get the latest update about long-term care homes, hear about the impacts of Bill 7 and other legislation, learn from frontline professionals about the current state of long-term care homes and care for seniors in this province. Tonight, we'll have the opportunity to hear from panelists who are very engaged with these issues, and you'll have time to express your concerns and questions. So if you want to pass on a comment that will be read out or ask a question of the panel, please use the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen. Don't use the raise hand feature or the chat features. We aren't utilizing them in tonight's event. We have a very simple agenda. I'll be introducing the panelists. Each of them will have up to seven minutes to speak. Then we'll go to questions and commentary by you, the participants, and then we'll have closing comments and some information. So I'm gonna start by introducing our panelists this evening. Start off with Jane Metis, staff lawyer and institutional advocate at Advocacy Center for the Elderly, ACE. She represents clients in long-term care homes, hospitals, psychiatric facilities, and care homes, retirement homes with respect to related legal issues. And I wanna say that Advocacy Center for the Elderly has had a long history coming out to Toronto Danforth, giving us information, always very solid, always very, very useful. I also wanna introduce as well, Dr. Dr. Amina Jabbar, staff physician at Trillium Health. She's a resident physician in geriatric medicine at McMaster University. Uh, and Dr. Kate Dupuy, Sheridan Center for Elder Research at Sheridan College in Oakville. Kate's a clinician scientist whose work lies at the intersection of arts, health, and aging. And with that, I'm going to go to our panelists. Jane, if we could start off with you. Sure. So I'm trying to get my little clock to go so that I can stop on time. Um, so my name is uh, Jane Midas, and I am a lawyer at the Advocacy Center for the Elderly. I'm what they call the institutional advocate. I'm one of two at our office. So I'm the, one of the lawyers who deals specifically with institutional issues. Uh, Long-term care and hospital discharges are primarily what I do. Uh, we have four other lawyers in our office, our executive director, plus three people who do intakes and litigation. Um, and we do issues with respect to being a senior um, and with respect to a variety of issues um, Basically, we can provide information to many um, seniors, uh, but we provide mostly representation to low income seniors. Um, so, you know, we might call and ask a question, but it doesn't necessarily mean that, you know, we'll represent you. Uh, we do all sorts of things from, um, you know, uh, people being taken advantage of, guardianship applications, and then, of course, our health and long term care, which is what I do. So since we don't have much time, I'm going to switch right into uh, sort of talking a little bit about um, kind of what I do and what what the what the sort of the situation in long term care is right now. I think that um, so I've been at the office for over 25 years. Um, so got lots of experience in in dealing with long term care and and hospitals and stuff. Um, the biggest issue that we have have had, you know, really throughout my career is the issues of hospital discharge. So people being uh, in hospital, uh, you know, these alternative level of care or ALC patients who are in hospital and where they're trying to move people out into long-term care. And we've been dealing with that for many, many, many years. Um, and uh, up until fairly recently, we were able to do a lot more pushback um, because hospitals and um, the, what used to be the Lynn and is now the HCCSS 
they uh, weren't able to force people, you know, into long-term care. The legislation didn't allow it. It was a consent process. And as um, many people may be aware, we're now in a situation where Bill 7 passed last summer. It was called the More Care, uh, More Beds, Better Care Act, which neither gave us more beds or better care in long-term care homes. And this legislation was very specific to remove the um, ability or the requirement, I should say, to consent to admissions um, and the whole process for admissions for people who were made ALC in hospitals. So what this means is that if you are in a hospital and you're um, destined to go to a long-term care, um, the, they can start the process without your consent. Even if you don't want to go to long-term care, they could start that process without your consent. And they can go through the whole process of applying to homes, doing your assessments, everything right up to the day of admission. What they can't do is they can't actually forcibly take you from a, long from a hospital to a long-term care home. Um, and there are some restrictions about distance, so 70 kilometers away, uh, from where you are in the southern part of Ontario and 150 or even more in the northern part um, of the province, depending on, um, uh, you know, availability of homes. Um, but they can't physically move you so that they, they, you can get up to the point and they can say, well, we have a bed in, you know, Shady Acres, which we've chosen for you. And, you know, they can't physically put you in that ambulance and make you go. But if you stayed in the hospital, they are now required by law to charge you $400 a day in a fee. It's not a fine like the Minister of Long-Term Care says it's a fee, um, but it is a $400 a day fee. And this is something that we've never had in Ontario. We've been very proud of the fact that we've always had a consent-based process and that you couldn't be forced into a place that you didn't want to go. Um, this has now changed. We are now in the middle of a charter challenge. Um, if you go to the ACE website, you can certainly see information about our charter challenge that we've done and um, all the materials that we have put in. And we're certainly looking for anybody who's had some experience with this sort of hospital, with them pressuring um, or choosing homes for you, et cetera. Um, with respect to sort of that long-term care process, one of the things that um, has happened is that um, a lot of people, when they hear that, you know, there's they're, they're often told, well, you have to choose short home, shortlist homes or homes in certain areas or something. Um, and that if you don't, they're gonna, you know, charge you $400 or something. People are choosing homes that they don't really want. We don't recommend you doing that. If the HCCSS wants to apply, that's actually better. Um, because if you actually put it on your choice list, that means that um, you, when you get admitted to that home, even though it really wasn't a home you wanted to choose and you only did it because of this threat of this $400, um, if you put it on your list, um, when you get admitted, uh, you go into a very low category for transfer, you're never going to move. If you say, well, if you put it on the list, maybe I'll go but I'm not putting it on the list and you let them do that. If you go into that home, uh, you will remain on the crisis list. It's still very unlikely you're gonna move. And this is a really big problem. People are being put in places where they you know, can't go, don't wanna be. Um, I guess a couple of other things just to mention, um, you know, long-term care, uh, we are, you know, they're trying to fix it up. Uh, Toronto's gonna to have a really big problem with homes shutting down. Um, and being uh, remodeled. Um, if you're looking for homes, make sure you look at the public reporting websites. There are good homes, there are bad homes. Do your homework, really look at what's going on in those homes um, by looking at the public reporting website. But it's unfortunate that we're really in a situation where in fact, the government is now providing less information that they used to in those reports. Um, and it's getting trickier to find information and to get information out of the government about them. Um, but if you are looking for long-term care, the best thing is to make sure that you've seen them or have somebody see them for you, do your homework and talk to people who have family or loved ones in those homes. I think I'm pretty much at my seven minutes and I will stop. You're on the button. Thank you very much. Um, before I go to our next panelist, just a reminder to all of you out there, if you have a question you wanna pose, or a comment you want to make, please put it into the Q&A function and that'll be passed along to me. Uh, for those of you who may have difficulty hearing, uh, at the bottom of your Zoom screen, there's a, 
uh, Nikon show captions, and that will give you an ongoing caption or subtitle of what's being said. So just again, a reminder, use the Q&A to post your comments and questions. Dr. Amina Jabbar, the floor is yours. Hi, everyone. Uh, thanks for having me uh, join the evening tonight. So I'm I'm a geriatrician. Uh, so I'm a doctor that specialized in the care of older adults. All of my patients, every single one of them, oh, almost every single one of them, over the age of 65. I am, I am a Toronto Danforther. However, my practice is actually um, located at, at Trillium Health Partners, so over in Mississauga. But with the way in which our borders are kind of drawn up, I also take a piece of Etobicoke with me. Uh, is part of my practice. To give you an idea of what my my practice looks like, I kind of go full spectrum. So I, if anyone here has been, ever been admitted to hospital, I look after patients who are inpatients as what we would call the most responsible physician. I'm often the consultant for other services within the hospital to provide geriatric advice, but I also see patients in clinic. Uh, and I have a patient practice that also includes home visits. So for lots of my patients who, for example, have end-stage dementia, who aren't mobile anymore, who can't walk, who can't talk very well anymore, and for them, it's really hard to get out uh, to be a doctor, I often will see them at least two or three times a year. So that gives you an idea of what the, the span of my work looks like. And on the academic side, I'm also a PhD candidate in the health policy program at McMaster's, specifically looking at issues of access around home care. So to give you an idea, I think broadly speaking, one of the things that I think I, I always want to impress upon people is how common it is um, to be having issues with aging. Um, just to kind of think about dementia, for example, in and of itself. After the age of 70, about 25% of people end up having dementia. After the age of 80, it's about 30%. And after the age of 90, we're talking about 50% of people end up having dementia. Um, the other thing is, is that we are now a generation of people who are living longer and longer because of how good medication and medical care is, generally speaking, for most people, not for everyone. Um, but on average, uh, the life expectancy in Canada is about 82. Um, if you look to the 1960s, it used to be 68. So we're talking about a huge uh, shift in terms of how long we live. You know, my my mom's generation, she remembers her grandparents passing away very quickly. Um, you know, often there's this sort of image of people just dropping dead one day and then you kind of move on with your life and that that's what life is like. Um, but you know, the death and dying process isn't like that. anymore. And so the reason I describe all of this particularly is because I think there's sometimes this image or this idea that not all of us are going to need long-term care and not all of us are going to need home care. When in fact, I think the vast majority of us, certainly on the call, I would imagine, because I would imagine all of you have an interest in this. Um, but I still think the vast majority of people are going to need to access we're going to know someone who needs to access home care and or long-term care at some point. And the dire state in which home care and long-term care is in right now is frankly absolutely unacceptable. So from the hospital end of things, what I'll tell you is I have many patients who are literally stuck in hospital because they are unable to go home with enough safe support set up. We don't have enough RPNs. We don't have enough personal support workers. We don't have enough services to provide people a way to age gracefully and with dignity. So that's one thing. The second thing is I have lots of patients as well who are desperately waiting for long-term care, who are on lists. But frankly, again, the wait lists are so long that it is frankly, unsafe for lots of people. Um, when I started my career about six, seven years ago, I remember I used to be able to tell patients, if you're on the crisis list, you will find a long-term care spot within three months. And now, frankly, if you are on a crisis list for long-term care, most of my patients, at least in the Peel region, are waiting close to 12 to 18 months for a crisis spot. 
And so what does crisis mean anymore in that situation, if not accessible to anybody? Um, the other thing that's frankly really concerning to me is, is that if you don't have money, you don't really have anywhere else to age. So the retirement home sector in Ontario is completely private. If you have the funds, which can be often anywhere from $4,000 to $7,000 to $10,000 a month, you know, people can afford that care. But if you're living in subsidized housing, if you have a very limited pension and then need supports, but don't have any supports from family or friends, for example, you're kind of out of luck. And we have such a limited social safety net at this point that there's nothing really there for us to scaffold us when we're actually aging with grace. And so like I've, I've already painted this picture there of saying, well, long-term care is kind of out of the option. Home care support's not that great. Then people are really struggling. Um, really right now, I think the biggest thing that we need to think about is thinking about how do we communicate to everyone about how desperately everybody is gonna need these services. It really boggles my mind how today Ford can get away with announcing free education for people who want to be treated as police officers, but that there's nothing happening for incentivizing people to go into work for personal support workers or RPNs or RNs or doing any of that work. That is what's going to save us fundamentally. Um, and I think that is a crisis to kind of think about and think also, I think, largely about how do we organize and move forward. So I'll leave it at that for now. Okay, Dr. Jabbar, thank you very much. Uh, again, a reminder to everyone, um, can you, if you want to have a comment taken out, put out loud, uh, if you have a question, please enter in the Q&A and we'll go through those when the panelists have finished speaking. Um, and again, a reminder that if you need closed captioning, there's an icon at the bottom of your screen, just click on that and you'll see a transcription of everything that's being said. And with that, uh, we'll go to you, Kate Dupuy. The floor is yours. Thank you so much, Peter. Thanks for having me. Thank you so much, Jane and Amina, for the great summarization of where we are. I think even the title of this event, you know, this the, the journey that many individuals are on, it's a very difficult journey to navigate and a lot of folks don't really know even the first place to start. So that's what I'd like to give a little bit of context to. Um, so I'm a clinical neuropsychologist, which means I'm a psychologist who specializes in disorders of the brain. And I work particularly with older individuals living with dementia. As Amina just said so eloquently, the number of individuals living with dementia, not only here, but across Canada and across the globe is simply projected to continue growing. The number one risk factor for dementia is age. So while it's normal for us to have some changes to our thinking skills and to our memory and to our language, as we get older, it's not normal for those changes to impact our ability to get through our everyday lives. And so that's really how we distinguish because we'll often come across people who say, oh, you know, everyone has memory slips and that is true, but those individuals that, you know, are starting to be impacted by their changes to their thinking skills, those are the folks that will often need a more advanced care. And in fact, if you look at the Ontario long-term care system, over 60% of the individuals living in our homes currently are living with dementia. And so that's really the, the, the target group that I focus on, not only the residents themselves, but their family and friend care partners, and also the staff. And I think that's where we're really coming from here in Ontario is that, um, we simply don't have enough beds for the number of people. Our population is projected to grow by almost a quarter of a million people over uh, the next decade, although we're only projecting to build another 30,000 uh, 30, beds in long-term care. So there simply won't be enough space for all of us. So if we're starting to think about where to place our advocacy, where to place our time, it's not only advocating for more spaces, but also the staffing. Because as much as the government enjoys going and saying, you know, we built this new home and this new home, the staff are burnt out, the staff are in crisis, and there simply aren't enough staff to care for everyone. The government is currently working towards increasing the hours of care that every resident will receive. Currently, the standard average of care is 2.75 hours a day. They're working to increase that to four hours a day by 2025. That is a quarter more care. We would theoretically then need a quarter more staff. And where are we going to get those individuals from? 
And the truth is, of course, you know, there has been so much negative reporting in the news. I will not discount that. But it's also important to remember that there are many individuals for whom long-term care is the option that is going to best serve their needs. People don't go into long-term care, you know, as sometimes there's reporting in the news about, oh, you know, just keep people home if you can. People who move into long-term care are doing it because they've been assessed within the community and this is the best place for them to access the care that they need in many cases. And so if you do have the opportunity, you know, you haven't been in hospital and are now being bill seven into a care home. If you have the opportunity to think to yourself about, you know, having this conversation with your family, talking about it with your spouse, or if you're an adult child, thinking of having this conversation with your parent, you may not really be sure, you know, how, how to go about navigating this. So um, what Jane had said, you know, there is public reporting around long-term care uh, that's going to be sent out. There is uh, also maps that you can do. You can enter your postal code to see what are the long-term care homes that are around your house, around uh, mom or dad's house. But you can also start to ask questions of the homes in the neighborhood. You know, if you do have that choice, start to think about what type of culture of care the home will have. Uh, talk to people about, you know, are they on a journey of culture change, which, you know, often means moving away from that more medicalized model of care to a more holistic uh, perspective of care. Um, talk about the types of services that are being offered. Uh, Long-term care homes must by law provide recreation activities for people, so meaningful and purposeful activities that can help them maintain their functional well-being or even improve their well-being. You know, we've heard so much about social isolation over the past three years in particular, so just looking to see what types of opportunities are available within the homes looking to see what types of individualized care plans are being offered. Are there um, cultural considerations around uh, the types of um, food and dietary offerings, you know, around the different types of cultural events that are taking place. So it's it seems like a, a scary thing when we're starting to start that process, either for ourselves or for a loved one. Uh, but there are a number of ways that we can sort of narrow down, if we do have the choice, narrow down the choices. But I think it is really important to understand here in Ontario that um, we will face a massive crisis in terms of staffing. And I was recently at a conference solely devoted to long-term care and heard a lot of creative and innovative things that staff are doing right now to try and address this. But you know, the sorry, sorry answer to all this, of course, is people need uh, people need good paying jobs. Many of these roles are being restricted. Many folks are turning to agency work because they will get paid more there than they will in other roles. Um, and so what we're really starting to hear is people falling through the cracks and staff leaving the sector. So one really important way, I think, when we're considering how we can all work together, because I know on Peter's, <laughs> especially here in Toronto Danforth, on Peter's town halls, people are often very, very eager to say, what can we do? What can we do next? You know, one of the key things is to advocate for uh, better staffing within our homes, better pay for our staff, um, you know, lower reliance on agency staffers who I'm sure, you know, are great, but it's not the same quality of care necessarily because you don't know the person, right? It's imagine someone showed up at your house and said, I'm going to give you a bath today and you'd never met them. You don't know them. Perhaps you're living with dementia. You already have some concerns or some suspicions. It can be very, very daunting for an individual. So we really need to advocate for this government to repeal Bill 124, to properly staff up our long-term care homes. This proposed um, you know, four hours of care sounds great, but two years is still a long way off. You know, How can we ramp this up and how can we ensure that people who are in long-term care, because they are one of the 78,000 people minimum in Ontario who need that specialized quality of care, how can we make sure that they're receiving the best, um, the best possible care that they can right now? So I'll stop there. Thank you. Okay. Okay. Thank you very much. Okay, everyone. We've got a really strong panel, and I want to thank all three of you for making very heavy-duty, contentful presentations. We've got quite a fair number of questions and comments. I want to say to everyone who's out there, if you have a comment that you want to pass on, a question you want to pose, please put it into the Q&A, and I'll be posing them to the panelists. The first one I have and I'm not sure which of you would be the best, but all three of you may have commentary on this. Uh, there, your opinion as panelists on the current quality of care transitions, uh, for instance, into a long-term care facility from a home setting for one, people with family supports, and separately, people without family supports. For example, 
single seniors living alone with advanced disability or disease conditions in terms of accessibility. How would you, uh, panelists, assess the current state of that? I can certainly yeah. go first. I mean, I think that, you know, I'm sure all of us have our opinions. I'm very interested to hear Mina since she works with the seniors so, so directly. I think that people who are, um, you know, transitions are really hard. Um, and right now, really because of Bill Saban and because of the lack of beds, the only way to get into long-term care is to be a crisis in a hospital, because even though you can be a crisis in the community, um, they're giving preference to crisis beds and the people in the hospital. So what's happening is that, you know, it's this sort of revolving door and you're getting sicker people. Um, you know, you talk about the four hours of care, that's just a number somebody pulled out of the you know, that was an old number. We don't actually know how much it takes to take care of people in the facilities. And so we do, if you are, um, you know, because people are sicker, they're much sicker when they're going in, they're much older. Um, and this just keeps ramping up. So that four hours isn't a reality, I don't think at all. Um, and we know that if you have family members or supporters, whatever, to come in and provide care and give that support or lots of people pay people to come in, your care is going to be better because it's going to be supplemented. And that's, of course, what fell apart during COVID. So um, it's bleak. And, you know, if you don't have that $10,000 a month to go to retirement home, you know, they're pushing you into uh, transitional care. Many of these transitional care, although they're funded, they actually have no oversight. There is no body to oversee them. They might be in a retirement home, but they're not have any oversight. It's pretty bleak out there. It really is. Okay. Um, the other two panelists, do either of you want to weigh in on this? Yeah, I can. I mean, it's so interesting because whenever I have patients come into hospital, um, the ones with families and the ones who have the ability to advocate are the ones who end up getting the most, right? I mean, frankly, I'll, I'll be honest, I was saying this to Jane, I mean, th the number of times I will refer people to ACE and the second families say, for example, to the discharge planners in the hospital, oh, I called ACE, they freak out. They step back and they go, oh no. And they start saying, okay, well, what can we put in? What can we make better? And so over and over again, I will say that, so, I love working in Mississauga because there is such a diverse range, specifically race, ethnicity, but also socioeconomic. And so you see the breadth of everything. And in particular, the north, there's a northwest pocket of Mississauga that's incredibly low income and also this sliver between Mississauga and Etobicoke that's also very low income. And hands down, every single time, over and over again, I have had now multiple cases where I've had patients of mine end up in hospital who need more care, who are unsafe to be discharged home, who still get pushed out of the home. And because they've got nowhere else to go, they go home. And so they start this whole revolving door over and over again of being in really safe, unsafe situations because there's nothing there to essentially scaffold these people and make sure that they can get any kind of adequate amount. It's awful. Okay, thank you. Kate, did you want to speak to this as well? Well, one thing I would say is we need to also rethink our acute care spaces. So hospitals are not older adult friendly, especially for older adults living with dementia. These are very jarring environments. We have loud bells, we have lights, we have bed checks constantly. Hospitals need to be made senior friendly, just like we have breastfeeding and baby friendly hospitals, because the reality is many, many older adults right now in Ontario are living in hospitals, right? That's where Bill 7 came from. Sometimes hospitals will have a quarter to a third of their beds or ALC. So if you're talking about transitioning someone from home to ALC to LTC, if someone has been in a bed for three weeks without really anything, they haven't had OT probably maybe a bit of, you know, obviously personal care, they haven't experienced recreational care, no leisure activities, their cognitive status may have been negatively impacted by the environment, then that transition to long-term care is gonna be even worse than it would have been. This, the burden on staffing will be much worse as well because all of a sudden a random person you don't know appears, they are quite dis deconditioned because of their experience in hospital. So it actually is even, you know, we talk about home care, of course, and long-term care, but in our acute care settings, they are not set up at all to support the number of older adults that are currently there. And so the government has a real opportunity here to reinvent what we do in acute care 
considering the current reality, which is that many of them are full of older adults and many of those older adults are living with dementia. And would you just, I'm not sure everyone knows what ALC is. So this is the alternate level of care. So it is not in eMERGE and it's typically more of a long stay bed. These are the beds that, you know, I went down to question period and I heard Doug Ford speak about them. These are those beds that people are saying, you know, they're bed blockers. So it's people who have perhaps had a fall either in their own home or in their long-term care space. They need to go to hospital, but they are not yet able to be discharged back or they're no longer able to go home. So now they are waiting on this crisis list to be placed in long-term care. So, you know, this was not expected. They may have been in intense physical pain because of, you know, the slip or the fall or the broken bone that led them to emerge. And, you know, I know at our local hospital, we have a huge number of ALC beds. And the concern of course then is also because so many of our long-term care homes are being sold. We actually have fewer and fewer beds here in East Toronto that are now available for individuals to transition out of that acute care setting in the hospital to a long-term care space. And I just wanted to say, just mention that when we're talking ALC and we're talking Bill 7, that specifically, uh, Bill 7 specifically deals with long-term care, but you can be ALC to any kind of other place. And in fact, only, a, a, only about a third of ALC patients are actually going to long-term care, but they generally have the longer waits, uh, except for maybe psych patients. Um, so they could be going waiting to go home, but they need some changes to the home, going to a retirement home, but they don't have a unit yet, could be going to chronic care, rehab, all of that. Um, and so when you, that, there's also this other big portion that nobody ever talks about. Um, they, you know, it's always the poor seniors who are going to long-term care that's the problem in the system, which of course is, they aren't. Thank you. Um, Dr. Jabbar, I'm going to go to you with this question. Your opinion on the matter of the shortage of geriatricians in Canada and what can be done to solve this gap of skilled care? Um, so of course I'm going to, as a geriatrician, be like, there's not enough geriatricians, I think. Um, no, but so in all seriousness, there are very few geriatricians. So the last time I had looked at the stats, I think there's 400 of us in the entire country. Whoa. Uh, and 200 of us in the province. So yes, there's there, like, we just don't have enough geriatricians. There's lots of reasons for that. But frankly, I'm not entirely, I, I do not think that increasing the number of geriatricians alone is gonna fix the problem. I am a very strong believer in the power of Care. Um, I, I can't, um, I can't, I, I, I'm not like a pediatrician as a geriatrician in that I don't provide primary care. Like I don't know the breadth that the family physicians know. And so often our, you know, our model of care really is I end up seeing patients a few times, probably I see them maybe at max of five times, and then I refer them back to the family physician to say, can you please help me manage their care? There's a few instances in which I will stay involved, particularly if there's somebody who's having really severe symptoms with their dementia, who are on really complicated medications, those kinds of things. But what we really need is incentivizing family physicians to do home visits, helping people actually die at home if that's what they want, to be able to have lots of collaborative teams where you've got family physicians working with nurses, working with nurse practitioners, with occupational therapists, with physiotherapists, with a very large team. Those are the things that really strengthen our ability to have people age gracefully within the community. So I think, yes, absolutely, we need geriatricians, but really what we really need is to strengthen primary care in creative ways. I think Kate was talking a little bit about this, but lots of different ways in which there's different models in which you can do things. Uh, but that's where I think really the bulk of our money goes to and time goes to. Thank you for that. Um, next question, Jane, I think you may be the best equipped to comment on this. Uh, why aren't the long-term care homes that are closing in downtown Toronto being replaced with more beds in downtown Toronto? It's great that new beds are opening up in Mississauga and other places, but not everyone can travel or wants to be out of the core. Um, I can give you an, uh, a response. I don't know that it's the answer to the question. Um, so in 2010, when they put in the new legislation, um, part of that was that homes were given 
um, that didn't meet the new standards were given a 10 year contract and were supposed to be rebuilt by 2020. I was on committees about this a ALC problem with the city of, Tr with the uh, Toronto Lynn at the time, the Toronto Central Lynn at the time. And every meeting I would ask, what are you doing about replacement beds? How are you going to stop homes from selling? What are you going to do when that home that is landlocked, even if they are going to rebuild and it has 200 people in it, they, it's not like out, you know, out in the burbs where they might have this giant parking lot. They're probably just a little square and it's all home, right? What are you going to do with those people? And they kept just saying, oh, well, they'll figure it out. They'll figure it out. Um, then we got to COVID 2020. Very few beds had been approved or anything had happened. The problem is, is that there's they're not making them do it. I, I don't know that you can force a company to continue to operate. We've already seen a couple of companies go. Um, and the, there's no incentive to them staying in Toronto, um, and therefore prop and, and the majority of these are for profit facilities. And so uh, that haven't rebuilt. Um, and so if you're a for profit facility and you're saying, okay, I could build a condo, I could build a really expensive retirement home, or I can do this long-term care thing, which is a real pain in the ass. Um, uh, they're getting out of it and there's been no planning. There's been nothing there have been really no forward planning by the government, successive governments, not just this one, um, even though this has been known since, you know, at least 2010. Okay, thank you. I, I'm gonna go on to the next question. We've got, we've got a lot of questions and comments. Um, question, well, comment combined with question, we're in a crisis and the pandemic exposed what is happening in the quote, warehouse long-term care facilities. With this in mind, why can't we talk about letting the aged and sick spend the remaining time on earth in their own homes? We have to then organize to get the care to the aged and sick. There are models in Europe and the USA that we can emulate. Uh, which of you would like to start responding to that? I can, I can certainly say that very quickly that there are many people who cannot be pr provided with care if you're living on your own, uh, if you're violent, if you have sundowning, there's a lot of people who don't get that. Um, we should be able to provide better care in the community, though, to prevent a lot of people from going. Um, and as Amina said earlier, it's there's no people to provide that care. We don't have the money. We don't have the people, even if we did have the money. Yeah, I, just to build on what, what Jane was saying there as well, is I think it, it's, it is so, it, it is very devastating to see someone um, progress with dementia and die from dementia. I mean, you're, you know, I have a handful of patients who fortunately are very financially capable, but for example, they're completely bed bound. Um, they need to be fed, they need to be changed, they can't verbalize anymore, and they can't be turned on a regular basis. Now, if you imagine having a large number of people like this, who are all in individual homes, you know, it's just, it's just what, what we have available, as it is what we have available, you know, there isn't enough PSW support to go around to provide the care. So, I think when I'm thinking about models of care, absolutely. I think when you think about really large long-term care homes, the way they're made is they are kind of the, that, that whole idea. If anyone I'm sure here has read Pat Armstrong and her work, you know, it, it, the larger homes are, were not made for personal connection. What you really need to do is staff those places up in very high levels. Or ideally, what you need is smaller homes with smaller numbers of people, so you can at least increase the ratios. But the name of the game, I think, no matter what, is more people within health. Okay, I'm going to go to the next question. Are there any concerted efforts to create an LGBTQ friendly environment in our province's long term care homes? The city of Toronto has some LGBTQ homes. Um, there's certainly been some work. Um, they have a manual. I wouldn't say it's perfect. I've dealt with homes that are really good. Um, as to my knowledge, there was some, there are some, certainly some homes down um, in the sort of the village area that have that. I think um, 
there's one home now that uh, I think one of the um, uh, the one on uh, Parliament or some Sherburn, maybe it's on Sherburn, that does have a, a section. There's a city home that does have a section. They're both really old and they're going to be moving. Um, they did the LGBTQ community did, did try to put in for a contract. I don't think that they got the beds. Um, so that's a political thing. So if you want them to do it, it has to that's political will, but there certainly are facilities that are providing out on some level, but not enough. And it's all in Toronto. Yeah. Uh, Dr. Jabbar, you had indicated a very small amount as well. Yeah, it's very small. I mean, the, there's a few Peel homes, of course, because that's where I know most of it, that are getting a little bit better. But, you know, frankly, it, you know, the healthcare in general is rife with heterosexism. And doesn't stop when we age, unfortunately. It's pretty bad. Okay. Um, next question. My mother spent her last five months in 2022 in a long-term care home where they had no access to dental care and she was too sick to travel to a dentist. It's too late for her, but is this being addressed now? Is anyone in a position to speak to that? I, I have to say before anyone answers, that that is just heart-wrenching. That's all I can say. Dental care in long-term care is very poor. Um, just getting your teeth brushed is, if you're you're lucky, if that happens, um, you know, dentures go lost all the time. One of the problems with our system, and I mean it's with our healthcare system in general, is that teeth are not covered. And so even if they bring in a dentist, um, if you're on low, if you're low income, so you only have $149 left a month, with which you have to pay prescriptions and stuff, you can't pay for the dentist. And that's always been a really big problem. Um, they should be bringing dental in more, um, but you know, again, it's sort of hit and miss um, and lots of people just can't afford it. And, you know, it's sometimes it's, you don't pay the home and, then you get the dental work or what have you. And it's it's very problematic. It also speaks to the fact that I think when you have a, a system like dental care, which is almost completely private, that there are so few people, dentists specifically, who are, <clears throat> pardon me, actually competent and good at providing care to older people uh, who have complex medical issues. So this is the other thing too, is that just, again, a lack of expertise and again, incentives to provide care to people in long-term care for them. Thank you. Really, really okay. scary. Thank you on that. Next question. If someone is discharged from the hospital and can't afford to go to long-term care, what can that person do? I'll answer that. So everybody in Ontario can afford long-term care. Um, it's uh, So if you're in a uh, any long-term care, whether it's owned by municipality, whether it's owned by a not-for-profit or whether it's privately owned, the, the fees are um, governed by regulation and everybody can go in in basic and everybody can apply for, uh, if you're low income, you can apply for long-term uh, for uh, rate reduction. And again, as I just sort of alluded to before, it's basically your income minus $149 and it can go down to zero. Um, so I have certainly had clients who pay zero because of various and sundry reasons. Um, we don't asset test, so they don't look at how much money you have in the bank. They don't look at whether you own a house, so you don't have to sell your houses or anything like that. Retirement homes are uh, for profit generally. Um, there are a couple of subsidized ones around here and there, but they're for the most part, they are for profit. They are not part of our health care system. It's all by contract. So what you get paid for is what you get. Um, and they're generally, the good ones are very, very expensive, but they're not part of our healthcare. But our long-term care homes, which are the ones that you have to go through the HCCSS, which used to be the LIN, uh, you can get subsidies if you're in basic. Okay, thank you for that. Um, Kate, I'm gonna pose this one to you. The health human resources crisis is worldwide. How can we solve this for Ontario? Are other countries figuring this out, perhaps by removing profit making from the system? My mother's long term care home has vacancies for executive director, director of care, infection protection, control manager, program manager, and physician for one of the units it is only temporary. She's the fourth one there in the past year. Existing staff have been cut back, so there are fewer PSWs and more agency nurses. 
Kate, do you want to address this human resources problem in this sector? I think the first thing I'd say is that North America and Western Europe are very unique because we do not have a collective society. We don't have a huge number of intergenerational families and households like they do in other parts of the world. So this long-term care system is quite unique. Um, and our need for staff is overwhelming. And what this government is trying to do is bring in internationally educated staffers from other parts of the world, um, which is you know, very helpful. But again, we're now taking health human resources from other parts of the world where they could be, you know, be, be giving services there. We need to pay people better. We need to give them permanent full-time jobs. So many people are working temporary or shift work, which is very difficult to manage, especially considering that the majority of this workforce is female, younger female. Many of them likely have families and children themselves. It's very, very difficult to manage shift work if you have kids who need to be dropped off at school or if you have a partner who's also working a different um, scheduled job. So we need to rely more on how do we how do we create shifts? You know, how do we make more um, permanent positions, more 32 to our positions, fewer eight, 16 hours. We also need to ensure that we are not stigmatizing this workforce, right? All we have heard over the last three years is how horrible long-term care is, how terrible it is. And let me tell you, I've heard the stories of hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of workers right across the country. These people are creative. You know, this government loves the word innovative. They should be talking to long-term care staff. These people have done incredible work with very few resources. And from an educational perspective, I do this with my own students, we need to also be showing people the joy, the purpose, the meaning that can be found within long-term care. You know, this is a journey people are on. This isn't just a warehouse where people are stacked until they die. These need to be people's homes. The culture of care within these spaces has to change. And it's a bit of a chicken in the egg, right? Because if you're constantly having staff turnover, how do you improve the culture of care within the home? So I think there are a number of different operators across the province who are attempting to do this. But as we heard earlier from the panelists, you know, just statistically speaking, there's only 78,000 beds. There's over 800,000 older adults. There's going to be 1.25 million older adults by 2030. We won't have enough beds. So we also need to rely a little bit less, I think, on only focusing on the long-term care, but also trying to consider how we keep people in their community, right? There are very few caregiving benefits for adult children or spouses or, you know, siblings who want to take care of a loved one within the home. There's no, there's really very limited resources or education Right? Most folks would have no idea how to help someone toilet, how to help someone bathe. We need large scale public education campaigns and we need grants and subsidies from the government so that people can stay home and, and you know, be supported. Just like we stay home on parental leave, there needs to be a lot more money being put into the system of keeping people at home because it is much cheaper to age in place in one's own home than it is you know, if we were to support them with family care partners, then it will be within the long-term care system, and especially then it would be in the acute care system if they're taking up a bed. Okay, Kate, thank you for that. This next question. My sister, 62, is a stroke survivor living in long-term care in Milton. Her husband lives overseas, and I'm her remote caregiver. Where can we find professional advice about income support, pension benefits, sorry, uh, income support, pension, and disability benefits. The family is funding her care, but that situation will change drastically in less than a year. Jane, you may be the most logical person for this, although if others have information, don't hesitate. I, I suspect that if there's an issue around money, perhaps they're in a retirement home, not in long-term care. Um, and there's a lot of people who don't under, you know, who mix up the difference there, so I'm not sure. Um, uh, you know, there certainly um, are many different kinds of government assistance, either from the province. Um, uh, she's 62, so uh, she would be entitled to ODSP, for example. And, you know, if she's in long-term care, that's set at a certain rate. But if she's in a retirement home, it's contract. It's like any other kind of place, and you're not going to get any kind of uh, break. Um you know, when she turns 65, she would get, you know, she might be able to get, for example, at 62, she, if she worked, she would get um, pension uh, CPP disability if she had worked potentially. Um, you know, I think there's information out there, but it's not going to pay for a retirement home, but it will pay for long-term care. Hey, I'm, I'm just going to add myself that 
Uh, I, I would suggest that people talk to their MPP's office. I mean, we provide support to constituents all the time. Uh, if you're talking about provincial programs, we're able to talk directly to the ministries, to, to their MPP liaisons and get information. Uh, so I don't think there's any just one spot you can go to. But for anything that relates to a provincial program, talk to your MPP uh, or their office, and they should be able to give you some information that will be useful in this situation. Um, sorry, I'm just going to go down here. A uh, comment, based on my experience, some of the retire what the retirement homes offer in assisted living isn't all that great. Uh, the ratio of staff to residents seems low and the recreational offerings are not that high quality. Feels like a scenario of pay more and get less. Sometimes I feel like they put people over profits. Um, and folks, I'm gonna, <laughs> I'm sorry, I realize we've got a lot of questions, but we're coming to the wrap up point. Last question and then I'll have commentary from our panelists. Was the problem of expensive pay for stay in hospital because they didn't want to go to a nursing home the same around the year 2000? So maybe I, I can jump in with the first question there, the one about retirement homes. So retirement homes in Ontario are differently regulated than long-term care homes. And so the ratio of care and the theoretical provision of care, number of hours of care is different. And there is no regulation within a retirement home space for recreation to be in the care plan the same way that it is in long-term care. So it is very likely that in a retirement home, even one with an assisted memory floor, whatever they're called, memory units, people have different names for them all across the sector. The recreational offerings do not have to be as, uh, you know, there doesn't have to be as many as there are within the long-term care homes because it is not regulated in the same way that it is under the Long-Term Care Act. So it is true to some extent. You have to look at the rec calendars. You know, if you're looking for a place for mom to go, most places will have them posted on the website. Talk to the residents if you can when you go in, talk to staff. Um, but it definitely is, it, it is a, it's a bit of a different beast for sure. Yeah, and I mean, when you're going into a retirement home, it is a tenancy where you purchase care. And so it is a buyer beware. They have to tell you what your package is, what you're paying for, um, but they can raise those the price for like the care portion. As long as they give you notice, there's no maximum. It's not like the rental portion of it. Um, if you go to the Clio website, which is cleo.on.ca and look for care home, it will talk about what information they have to provide you with respect to a care home, which a, a retirement home is a type of care home. Um, and so I think that's it, but it is a buyer beware. It's all by contract. So, you know, it's depending on what you pay for. And if you're not happy, you can take action, legal action, but it's always a problem. I think the other question had to do with, was there a similar problem around ALC in 2000? Yes, uh, it just has gotten worse, that's all. Um, and there's been, you know, I've been dealing with this issue, um, you know, when I was preparing the Charter Challenge, I was going back and looking at materials from the 90s. Okay, um, with that panelists, it's time for us to have a wrap up. Um, Dr. Jabbar, I'll start with you. If I could give each of you a minute uh, for some parting words, please. Sure. I mean, I think that the biggest thing that I always want to impress upon people is that this is a system that we've not invested in and we the, the need to invest in the system is long overdue. The idea that we won't need it, it's very unlikely. Everyone will need to have it. And, you know, I think we really, really have to organize and push this government um, and think about the next election coming up around really prioritizing elder care, older care, aging in community. How do we get older? How do we pass that way with dignity eventually? All of those things that has to be part of our social safety. Thank you. Um, Kate. So I guess in addition to advocating to the larger scale systemic government to actually invest in home care in order in order for us to be able to, as we, you know, if, if you actually ask people, the majority of folks in Ontario say they want to remain in their own home until the end. People that do not typically want to move to long-term care, that's sort of a something that many folks will have to do, but people when asked want to stay at home. So what we can do is obviously advocate at a larger scale, better home care, better acute care, so people can come back home and not be waiting for those uh, long-term care beds. But we also have to think of what we can do ourselves 
So there's no, you know, magic potion to age successfully, but we do know that things like keeping your brain active, eating well, staying physically fit, trying to reduce stress because stress hormone cortisol acts very poorly on the brain, um, you know, trying to get a lot of uh, outdoor activities, social interaction. There's a lot of things that we can do. Um, many personal risk factors are outside of our control, you know, genetics, things like that. But there are a lot of lifestyle changes that we can make to help ourselves at least have the best possible shot at aging successfully. Um, and so that's more of a personal responsibility thing in addition to the wide scale, you know, advocating up to the governmental levels to change the system. Thank you very much. Jane, you get the last word. Thank you. Um, I guess really what I would say is that whether you're looking to stay in your home, going to retirement home, you're in the hospital, long-term care, it doesn't matter. Um, you need to educate yourself, whether it's for yourself or your family member. Don't accept what um, anyone tells you from like the hospital or the HCCSS or what have you. If they say, oh, you're only allowed to have, you know, one hour a week or, you know, you have to choose five or whatever, um, go to a, a, a source like our office or, you know, there's lots of materials around the Ontario Association of Residence Councils, whomever, get the information that you need because unfortunately, um, you know, I spent a lot of my time um, dealing with issues where people are just given incorrect information. And I think as Amina said, you know, this is where, you know, I come in and they go, oh, ACE call, you know, it's not that I have a magic bullet, it's just that I know what the rules are. And those poor people who don't have family members and aren't able to speak up, those are the ones that are often getting chapted. So get the information, find out what the rules are, and don't just accept what you're being told. Thank you very much. I, I, folks, I have to say, you three panelists have been excellent. Just really rich content. I think that this webinar, when it's posted out there, is going to get an awful lot of views because I think you've filled in an awful lot of gaps for people. I want to thank my staff, Elaine, Rob, Louise, uh, for pulling everything together and making sure that technically we're actually here throughout the whole, whole session. Uh, and to all of you participants, thanks for joining in this evening. I uh, appreciated the questions, and I hope that the information you've gotten tonight you'll be able to use in your lives with friends and with family. I want to remind you that uh, we'll be sending out information on petitions, uh, on actions, uh, on how to follow this on social media. We will be posting this uh, session on YouTube so that people can access it. We'll be sending out a package and we'll add people, if you're interested, to our distribution list so you know about upcoming information sessions. And with that, I want to thank everyone uh, and to everyone, have a very good night. Take care and I'll see you all soon.